Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. And here we are. This is Sean Martin. You're very welcome to a new Their Story podcast webcast here on ITSB Magazine. And today we are going to look at what safe harbor safe harbor is and uh, what a recognized security program is and how that impacts how organizations like health healthcare organizations and otherwise uh, are preparing for some new challenges or new 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 uh, guidance and regulations coming from uh, HHS uh, OCR and uh, clearly I'm not uh, versed in all the ins and outs of all this stuff, which is why I have two folks joining me today, uh, Michael Parisi and John Houston. Thanks for uh, joining the joining the episode today. Happy to be here. Thanks, Sean. And uh, b- before we get into what all this means, uh, a quick word from each of you, uh, who you are, what your role is, and, and maybe why this topic is important. And John, I'll, I'll start with you. Great. Thanks. I... Uh, I am the vice president responsible for privacy and information security at uh, UPMC, which is a, uh, about a $23 billion health system out of Western Pennsylvania. And um, uh, really the, the topic's important to me because obviously I'm responsible for information security. Um, and I've been looking for methods, not just to able to um, uh manage my own security organization and ensure that we're doing the right things, but also looking for a way to uh, also measure my uh, third parties that I have to work with that uh, have access to or um, or store um, patient information uh, for my organization. So uh, this is a topic of great interest to me. Perfect. Looking forward to it. And Michael? Yeah, thanks, Sean. So Mike Parisi, I'm the Vice President of Adoption here at, at High Trust. Um, my role is really to help the community and ecosystem in addressing common challenges and in information security and privacy and doing that in um, the most efficient and effective way possible. So this this topic is near and dear to my heart and our hearts here at High Trust. Um, because we feel very strongly around what the definition of some of these terms are that HHS and the OCR is asking uh, for feedback on through their RFI that was released in, uh, in, in April of this year. And, um, you know, I think part of the discussion that we'll, we'll get into today is striking that balance, um, ensuring that the bar is high enough to be uh, recognize security practices, but also um, protecting you know patient data, and patient information, as as John mentioned, um, but also ensuring that it is not overly burdensome for organizations to show that they're doing the right thing from a program perspective. So I think John and I and Sean, you know, you, you as well, we've got all, all kinds of thoughts in terms of um, how to respond to this and. We at High Trust are actively working a response, not only for ourselves, but for uh, the community as as well as organizations that have adopted or become High Trust certified, um, or those that are looking to leverage that in order to satisfy a number of these requirements. Yeah, I love it. And Mike, I'm going to come back to you for uh, for you to set the stage here. But I guess the, the the point I'll make as we kick this off is, is the Health and Human Services uh, Office of, for Civil Rights uh, put out an RFI looking at what a recognized uh, security practice is in, with respect to high, uh, high tech. And you mentioned a few words there, um, reliability, uh, assurance. I think that the definition of what that is is important. And uh, you mentioned in the context of setting the bar, but I think whatever gets 
described and defined and prescribed here uh, needs to be meaningful for the whole healthcare ecosystem. And I think that's what we're, what we're going to be talking about here today here is hope, hoping to set the, the stage for HHS, OCR, and the community to kind of say, here's what's important. Here's how we want to operate together. Here's, here's how that looks from our perspective. And, and not just to hear your thoughts and maybe even me share a few of my own, but to rally the CISO community in the healthcare space to say, this is important. Share your thoughts here with HHS. Um, so with that, Michael, maybe, maybe a little more background on, on what, what this is and uh, maybe a few points in there uh, to get us rolling. Sure. Yeah. So um, back, I think it was in, in 2021, you know, Congress passed what they refer to as the HIPAA safe harbor bill. And the, the idea behind that was to provide potential relief for healthcare organizations you know, like, like, like John's, right, and, and, and others that adopt the most rigorous of information security protections. Um, but unfortunately, still face severe penalties. Obviously, if, if a data breach were to to occur uh, beyond their their control, um, but it was really to offer this concept of safe harbor for those organizations that adopt the most rigorous information security uh, protections. Right. So I'm I'm very pleased to see that the OCR is beginning the regulation development process to really implement the allowances included within the HIPAA safe harbor bill, because that, that hasn't been defined yet, right? Which is why they've reached out to the community in the form of an RFI um, with a series of questions to help understand what does the community see as being the most rigorous information protection uh, programs and, and policies. And I think the, the important thing to focus on, Sean, is when you look at one of the primary goals associated with this concept of safe harbor, because not everyone's going to get it, not everyone should get it. Uh, one of the primary goals is, is, of the provision is to encourage covered entities, right? So hospital systems like, like John's uh, health plans, et cetera, but also, and, and probably even more importantly, business associates. So the vendors that operate within that community to do, uh, quote, everything in their power to safeguard patient data, unquote, right? I think that's the key aspect is when we look at the questions that HHS OCR are asking, we need to um, answer those questions through the lens of doing everything in our power to safeguard patient data. And that's everything from understanding um, how we define recognized security practices to how those security practices are validated in our vernacular, right? It's one thing to choose a framework and implement it. It's another thing to have somebody come in and audit that, right? And independently validate that you're actually doing um, what you need to be doing. So those, I think, are, are the key elements to the, the conversation. And when we're responding um, to HHS and responding to the, the RFI, um, we need to be, you know, very careful to make sure that that bar is held high enough that aligns to doing everything in an organization's power to protect sensitive information. So, John, uh, a lot there, uh, as described by Mike, that uh, I presume gets you thinking about your, your current program, how that might be impacted, uh, and hopefully even how the, the level of effort that you put into building your program might actually help inform HHS for what is possible, how is it possible at scale, and how can the whole healthcare ecosystem benefit from some of the work that you've done? Because I know you've, you've, you've put a lot into uh, to doing things that, Maybe not exactly perfect because nothing is, but in, in a very solid, solid manner, right? I I've tried for my program to, to take a very disciplined approach, so we build a, a mature security program, and and the value of having a disciplined, mature security program based upon a, a, a framework 
is because we know that business is our business is going to change, technologies change, and the security threats change. They change constantly. But if you have a mature program and you've implemented it in a thoughtful fashion using a framework, then as all of those three variables change, your program should, by its nature, change, adapt to be able to confront the, the, the security challenges that we face today, okay? So I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to build a program based upon what I've just described. Uh, so I look at, and I'm, I, I will lay my cards on the table. I, I, I use high trust. I'm high trust certified, find great value in that framework. I push my, my strategic vendors to be high trust certified because by having that certification says to me that that organization has a mature security uh, program based upon a proven framework. And so I can accept, expect then that their program is going to adapt as you know, threats, business, technologies change. So it's really important to, to have that level of discipline. Um, and I think that, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's what HHS is doing is really, I think, incentivizing people to do the right thing. And by giving that this incentive and people saying maybe in the past where they maybe said, oh, you know, high trust is outside of my reach in the past. By looking at this rule saying, you know something, now maybe it's the time for me to embrace high trust. Because, boy, I'll tell you, it's going to give me that not only is it going to help me to mature my program, but if something should happen, it is evidence to HHS that I'm doing, trying to do the right thing. So this is all very important. And, 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 and so, yeah, I probably sound a little bit by, by, by like a high trust bigot, but I'm not. I just think it serves an important purpose. And the safe harbor rule, I think really honestly is, is a, to me is, it should act as proof of, of the value of something like having a high trust certification. Yeah, and I think, uh, well, I, for me, obviously, I'm, I'm very familiar with what iTrust does. And uh, John, you and I have, have had conversations with Michael and and others like Omar uh, Kawaja. And I think the, the level of effort that goes into iTrust to understand what the risks are and what controls need to be put in place in a way that allows you and your third parties to say, this is what's important for me. This is what's important for us as an ecosystem um, is extremely valuable, right? And to, to try to replicate that over and over and over individually at every organization is difficult. And I think a lot of the work that high, uh, HHS is trying to do here is important for that. So, so let me, let me, let me step into, high, into HHS's position. I mean, I'm, let me, okay. I, if I'm them, just like I am myself, when I'm dealing with a third party, Okay, let's just say I've got a, uh, somebody providing a cloud-based solution that I need to use. Okay, that cloud-based solution to me is very difficult to assess. I want to be able to assess their security. I want to be able to understand the, the maturity of their program and, their, and the framework that they're using. I want to be able to feel comfortable that that third party is doing what it should be to safeguard my information. Okay, so HHS should have the same goal which is they want to make sure that providers and, and business associates alike have all, all have a, a mature program and security program in place. That's the end goal. Okay. And I've said many a time that when I have to go in and try to do an assessment, my team do an assessment of a third party using questionnaires and other things, on a scale of one to 10, my confidence level of the value of that assessment is about a three, not because my people are bad or they have bad processes, but it's so hard to get good information out of a third party. It's so, it's so much effort to try to do an independent assessment. But now let's take high trust and say, you know something, third party, you know, I want you to be high trust certified. Or if a third party comes to me and says, I'm high trust certified, 
my level of confidence on that same scale of one to 10 goes from a three to about an eight. It is, I, I might make it mad at me for saying this high trust isn't perfect, but my God, it's so much better as a, you know, as a framework and a certification process than almost any third, any, any provider can do today by a long margin. So if I can go for a three to an eight, in terms of my confidence level and that that third party, boy, I'm, I, I, I'll take it every time. And, and it's so important. It lays it, it, it's, it's, it allows us to, to, I think Mike said earlier, to, to raise the bar, raise the, 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 the standard in the industry. Um, it give us the, this, this, this ability to, 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 to credibly assess very quickly that the, the, the security posture of that organization before we're going to entrust it with our data. So, you know, what HHS is doing, I laud. I think it's a great thing. Um, you know, it, it, it again, and using high trust, then it allows HHS as well as, as like organizations like myself be able to very quickly say, get comfortable with somebody's security, say, you know, something they're doing the right thing. They got the right program in place. They, they get that level of maturity that I can trust. And Ma yeah, Michael, too. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, we're certainly not perfect, or else I, I want to be em employed. Uh, so <laughs> I, I completely agree with that. And, and Sean, maybe before you, you jump in, you know, what, what John was just alluding to, the, the level of comfort he gets knowing that organizations are high trust certified or have used that um, from a programmatic perspective. You know, ironically enough, it, it ties back to, and I love the analogy that he used, think of HHS as a relying party, right? Or OCR as a relying party. And all these organizations as part of the ecosystem are their third parties or vendors, right? Um, to a certain extent. But what John is alluding to is that that level of comfort that he gets is because high trust is um, recognized security practices, right? That, that regulated entities have, have implemented. And that's exactly one of the points that HHS is, is getting to with, with their RFI and they're trying to collect information about what recognized security practices have regulated entities implemented. And, and the mm -hmm. definition of recognized security practices is different um, from this idea of providing um, you know, demonstrative evidence that those recognized security practices are actually implemented or are in place, right, and mm -hmm. operating effectively. And, and so, think about this. Yeah. What High Trust provides is an end. First of all, we use an independent assessor that once they get done doing their assessment and gathering gathering their evidence, all of that information gets submitted to High Trust. And high trust has a, a, they have standards, they got a rigorous QA process to assess the, the materials that have been delivered, provided by that assessor. And only if high trust is satisfied with, with those materials, will they provide a score, which if it's high enough, will give a certification. So you've, you've got a, a, a clearinghouse that's able to ensure that there is a, um, uh, a consistent level, or when I, when I actually maybe say a different way, if I look at a certification and a score from, from one vendor or third party versus another, because of the fact that the, the, the way that high trust has a, in their QA process is structured, I know when I see a three or a three plus or a four, I know what that means. And it's going to be consistent across the industry. I don't have to worry about the fact that, oh, that assessor gave him a three and this assessor gave him a four, but I don't know if I trust them to be any, are they better? Are they worse? No, I know that all what high trust does is by inserting themselves in the middle of this with a, in a, with a rigorous QA process. I know that when I see a three, it's a three, no matter where it came from. I know a four is a four and a two is a two. I, I don't have to worry about deciding whether, um, whether that that score really is genuine or not, it, it's it's already gone through a level of a review that that allows me to be able to rely upon it. Um, so I think yeah, that's a, a, a huge value to certification and the, the certification process they have. And maybe Michael, some some thoughts from here because I think it's one thing to say we're we've implemented a, uh, a recognized security practice, right? right. <laughs> Another right. to demonstrate it as John is pointing out. And it, it's not to, 
it goes beyond just demonstrating that you got a three or a four, right? Um, you could easily make fun of uh, risk scoring or security posture scoring. Um, but when you know and you can actually view the scope of that assessment and and where the controls are, you, you get a, f a list of the gaps, right? And, and perhaps even a, a, a memo from the, the assessed party that says, I'm working on mitigating or closing these gaps, right? Mm -hmm. And and kind of to John's point, I I trust or I can see that they're doing the right thing here. So talk to me about what HHS is is putting forth here and how is there enough language in there around being able to demonstrate or is this an area do you think uh folks like John and others in the industry should be uh, kind of putting forward that demonstration is key. The, the independent, reliable assurance is, is important. Yeah, I think the latter is needed, Sean. So is there enough as it stands today? I would argue no, right? Which is why it's one of the elements that's included within their RFI. I think that's, that, that's point one. Um, point two, HHS and OCR need to make sure that they have a level of specificity to your point to define what's appropriate um, to show that these recognized security practices are quote unquote in place. And what's interesting is when you, when you look at the questions and what they're trying to get at, you can argue, you know, you can piece together a number of different programs and activities that exist within an organization. It's going to be quite painful and it's not going to be as easy or seamless than if you had an integrated program that not only helps you ensure you've implemented recognized security practices, but also prove that they're in place and in place over a period of time and have a program that gives you comfort that they will continue to be in place. Obviously, what I'm alluding to is the high trust approach, right? I think John commented upon this. It's it's not that his organization and his vendors need to go select, for example, NIST, and then further define the level of specificity with another set of controls that can actually be implemented. How do they align to NIST? Then go do some type of proprietary assessment to prove that they're in place. All of that is baked into the high trust approach and gets to a number of the elements that they're asking about. Although strategies such as self attestations and checklists may be effective point in time demonstrations, um, they lack reliability and they lack the assurance that comes from adopting a strong cybersecurity framework that also includes a corresponding third party assessment or certification uh, that is consistent, right? So back to John's point, the only way this really works is to have a level of consistency. If you have organizations that are running around doing 20 different things, if you are the relying party, if I'm HHS or OCR, how do I evaluate that this organization has effectively implemented recognized security practices versus somebody else if what I'm looking at isn't consistent, right? Not only from a framework standpoint, but in terms of how they're proving that they've put that in place. Think about the nightmare that that's going to create. I mean, there's HHS and OCR can't handle their workload today as it relates to what they're supposed to be doing, right? Imagine all of these cases that they need to review and say, well, does this meet the bar of safe harbor, safe harbor or does it not? So consistency, I think, is is really important, and it's something that that they're getting at um, in their questions in the RFI. And, and, and lastly, um, you know, they're specifically asking what are the steps that covered entities um, need to take to ensure that once those recognized security practices are defined and in place, that they're actively, and they specifically say this, consistently are in use continuously over a period of time, right? So they are focused on con consistency and, and they wanna know, 
how are organizations ensuring consistency and how do they make sure they're in place over a period of time? And maybe to put a little slightly different spin on what Michael just uh, said, is I think you know, HHS absolutely and OCR, are, they, they have a lot on their plates and their ability to really dig into and do a, a, an, an assessment in the event of some issue, is, is, is that's, that's a pretty heavy lift. I think it's an opportunity for OCR as well to be able to um, rely upon, you know, uh, something like high trust and then be able to focus its efforts on those organizations that frankly have chosen not to, to spend the effort to, to, to go through and, and build a frame of a street program and a framework and, and get high trust certification, things like that. So it get, it, I, I would think if, again, if, if the industry is smart here, mm -hmm. They'll look at what HHS is at, telling them, hey, we're going to we're going to if you do these things, you know, we're going to we're going to be willing to accept that in the event of, of, of a breach and an investigation. Um, and so it, it serves the industry and, and us because we, you know, we have some level of comfort that that uh, if we have these programs in place that we can then rely upon them if. if OCR comes knocking on our door, but at the same time, I think it allows OCR then to, to free up resources to focus on on maybe more urgent things that they should be working on. Um, yeah, so it's and, it, and John, can I, I'm going to pause you because I'm I'm just thinking through that that scenario where investigations are taking place, and it, if the bar is set too low here, right, and there's little visibility, yep. uh, little granularity. And now OCR is starting to dig around to figure out, well, what controls were in place, which ones weren't, were they yep. connected to the, this particular incident, uh, what, what tactics and techniques were involved, and, and how does that all look? If the bar is set low, my, my assumption would be that effort is just going to be overwhelming versus oh. if you have a very high bar with a lot of granular, granularity and uh, visibility and consistency, as Mike points out, it's going to be much easier to pinpoint where things fell apart, right? Well, I, hopefully things don't fall apart. Uh, right. But hopefully, you know, it's, it's, it's clear on the face. Because I think what OCR is trying to do here is that they know we're, that, that, that we're, we're, going to have, we're going to have breaches. I mean, we, we live in an ugly world, um, you know, and, and I think they're trying to, to, A, reduce the number of breaches or the likelihood of breaches. But also, you know, the understanding that we're not going to be perfect, that our organizations aren't going to be perfect and that there are always going to be breaches, that, that, that at least that, that they want to be able to eat very quickly be able to conclude that this, this organization still tried to do the right thing. It had a discipline program in place. It's not for the lack of their efforts that they, that, that they got breached. It, it happened. And so I think that that's part of the motivations here. And I think, you know, by giving organizations, you know, this, I don't want to say get out of jail free card, because that's not really the right way to look at it. But by, by telling organizations that this, that we're willing, you know, what they're willing to accept and um, giving them something to aim at, I think um, it, again, is an incentive maybe for organizations to spend a little bit more than they are currently spending, focus on a little bit more than they're are already focused, um, getting them to end goal, of a, which is really improved security throughout. Um, I, I just would like to think that once they get past cybersecurity, then maybe they look at other ways to, to incentivize organizations um, with respect to, to privacy centric matters and the like, because, um, you know, I think there's a, this is, again, if, if you, if you properly incentivize organizations, give them, you know, something to aim at some, some reason to do it, I, they'll do it. Um, yeah. And, may, and this, is the, this is the value here. Yeah. And, and Michael, I want you, John, I know you'll have thoughts on this. So I'm, I'm, after Michael, uh, you, you can share them, but I, I want to get your thoughts on the, the whole dynamic nature of threats and to, I guess if, if the ultimate goal is to avoid the breach in the first place, uh, you really kind of want to focus on what's most important and most relevant for your organization. It's going to look different from a, a health a hospital system versus a payer versus a, a doctor's office, right? And I guess my point is, 
if the bar is too high for everybody to reach um, and it's too costly, uh, they're probably not going to do that. But if you can focus in on the right things for your organization in the context of what you do in business with John, let's say, as a third party, um, if you can achieve that bar in, the, in a smarter, not harder, more costly way, um, to me, that seems better. So I know iTrust has been working on a thing called Threat Adaptive, which really looks at the current threat landscape uh, where it's targeting uh, different entities and different technologies and, and things are happening in the wild, which can help frame and shape the risk assessment and the controls that you put in place to, uh, to, to address them. So maybe some thoughts on that. And then John, I'd like your, your thoughts on the whole dynamic nature of threats in the context of this as well. Yeah, Sean. So, um, you know, you and I had had a similar conversation actually earlier today around this concept of rationalizing uh, control selection, right? And unfortunately, I think a lot of organizations have probably done too much and, and too much of um, initiatives or are things that don't make sense relative to addressing the cyber threats and risks to, to, to your point, Sean. So I think what's important through this lens and, and what OCR certainly cares about as, as well, what HHS cares about, um, is this pro proliferation of threats, right? As, as threats continue to proliferate and change, healthcare organizations remain one of, and, and in many instances, the most prized target, right? For, for many different reasons. And, you know, while most organizations have taken some type of comprehensive approach to ensure they've implemented practices that provide um, risk management programs with higher levels of, of security, many are still reluctant to engage outside that box or beyond, say, a, a self-assessment or attestation of, uh, of their system. And they become very checkbox oriented, right, as opposed to starting with the threats and then identifying what are the appropriate safeguards, if you will, to implement to address those threats, those indicators of compromise, um, and do it in, in a scalable fashion, right? So I think what's important, and this 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 would be an, an, an interesting discussion to have with, with OCR and HHS and, and everything that I've read, I haven't explicitly seen this anywhere. Um, but in, in, an additional question I would ask um, outside of, if I were them, outside of, you know, what recognized security practices have regulated entities implemented, I, I would ask further, um, do those recognized security practices address, appropriately address cyber threats or better, are they threat adaptive? Right. So how do you know, to me, if I'm going to implement a recognized security practice and I'm going to do it effectively, it better be something, taking it back to some of John's first comments, um, that adapts to the changes in the threat landscape, that conforms to changes in underlying authoritative sources and requirements. Because what's important today is not going to be necessarily everything that's important tomorrow. I mean, just think about what's happened with some of these controls that we've seen within our lifetimes. I mean, I, I think we're going to get to a point where the concept of password controls will probably no longer exist at some point, right? And some of those changes are reflective of what's happening from a threat landscape perspective. So to me, in order to have appropriate security practices implemented, it needs to be something uh, that adapts to those underlying changes in the cyber threat landscape. You know, what? what is the purpose of implementing a framework? And I go back to my initial uh, comment, which was one of my initial comments, which was that, you know, business practices continue to change. Uh, our technologies continue to change and threats continue to change. And the value of a framework, if properly implemented in a mature fashion, is as all of those things change, your security program adapts, okay? 
if you're and I see a lot of, of, of CISOs who get who get you know laser focused on some great technology and the you know and, and, and whatever that might be, they're not they're not rather than being focused on the big picture, they're focused on some point solution to solve some problem that they have or some some threat that they, they perceive. But absent of uh, an overarching framework that, that guides them, okay, that 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 implementation that, that technology might be great today, but what happens when the threat changes tomorrow? Um, you need a much more disciplined process in place in order to continue to adapt. Um, you know, it's like it, it's just that again. Why something like a high trust is, is and, and, and certification is so important because it says I got a mature program. It's been certified as being a mature program. It's 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 one that's designed to adapt as ever as as threats change, technologies change, our business requirements change. That's the value of it. So I I I I get more comfort, or people should get more comfort that my program is going to stand up, regardless of what happens. And I'll give you a great example of this because I actually had to. to no, I didn't have to. I presented before our, our one of our board committees this week. And I gave them an update on the Russian-Ukraine conflict. And this I'll just use as an example. Okay, the the you know yes we there because of the conflict there has been a heightened you know issues around cyber and and, and potential impact on uh, critical infrastructure in the United States uh, as as well as, as throughout the world. Um, and one of the things that I said to the, this the committee was. Uh, you know, really, frankly, what we're doing is, is we we're, we're we haven't made any specific changes because of the conflict, but rather we're we're running our program, and our program is designed to deal with things like the outbreak of a war. Our program's designed if some new threat emerges because of the outbreak of that war. So we're not scrambling to say, oh, my God, what should we do? Because all of a sudden Russia's invaded the Ukraine. Rather, the program is designed with just that in mind that something's going to happen. Something's going to change. And the program needs to very, be able to very quickly adapt, you know, whether it be intelligence feeds, whether it be, you know, um, country blocking or, you know, discriminating traffic in a different way. That's all designed into the program. Because, you know, if I were to look back six months ago or ask you six months ago whether, whether Russia would invade Ukraine, you probably would have said, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, God only knows what's going to happen in a month or two or three months, you know, but my program needs to be able to adapt and it needs to be able to adapt in a seamless, you know, fashion. Um, will I will I my program continue to identify ways to mature itself and ways that it needs to change to adapt absolutely but that's going to be through the normal evolution of my program based upon the application of a, a of a framework and you know and, and the like so i'm really to again you you've got to build a firm foundation and rely upon it to help guide you through these types of issues rather than saying oh my god i got to go out and change my firewalls or do this or buy some new technology because, you know, no, that, that should happen through the program, not as a result of some event or some issue. And, and Sean, just to add a, a little bit there, I love where, where John was going, you, you know, I, I think security, unfortunately is stuck in reactive mode at many organizations, right. And to, to, to John's point, when, when you're at war, um, Re reacting to your enemy is the worst position to be in. And unfortunately, that's how most cybersecurity teams are forced to operate. If you look at perimeter defense tools like firewalls, IDS, IPS, I mean, they do an essential but incomplete job, right? Mm -hmm. and, and to John's point, as, as organizations um, predominantly approach cybersecurity by relying heavily on reactive monitoring and incident response. But they're hoping to head off each threat before it does serious harm. Um, but that's not the position you, you want to be in. And if if you're if you're so relying upon what I like to call you know security heroes to to fight threats, 
that's that's a poor use of of resources and it's indicative of um, a program that is not designed uh, appropriately or not operating effectively so you know, i think to reverse these current trends surrounding cybersecurity spending and outcomes, we need to reevaluate the fundamental principles of cybersecurity and cybersecurity programs uh, to, to, to what John's alluding to, right? Either, either you, when, when we think about the, the threats from a cyber standpoint, either you lead the enemy or the enemy is going to lead you. And if the enemy is leading you, you're in reactive mode. And you really need to reevaluate your, your your program. I, I agree with Mike, and I, I and let me also say this. You know, one of one of the key aspects of my program and my my team's efforts is is something that um, came out in uh, some OCR um, tabletop um, audits. Um, this is my God, probably four or five six years ago. OCR said that most organizations failed their risk assessment because they didn't know where their data is at. And that's becoming a much more acute problem because of the fact that more and more data is moving to the cloud. So we've taken an enormous amount of time and an enormous amount of effort to be able to identify where all our data assets are at, whether they be in some third party's hands or whether they be within our environment, in the cloud, whatever. So, you know, part of having a mature program and part of being able to defend and, and, and the like is also understanding where your data assets, the things you're trying to protect, that where they reside at. And so, um, you know, I, I, and, and as we move our things, you know, our data assets to the cloud, um, understanding what it takes to, to um, maintain operations is also very important. If I'm if I'm reliant upon a, a cloud-based service to deliver my healthcare to my patients, I better have a strategy around how to make sure that it's available. Make sure that that vendor has a robust security program in place to to, to ensure it's available. And and so that is absolutely crucial. And again, why if that's also why what OCR is doing is so important because we got to be able to assess understand where our assets, the data assets are and, and, and be able to assess the credibility of the, the, our, our third parties programs. Um, it, it, absolutely vital. And, and I can't underscore that the, the importance of it. Yeah. And that, that speaks directly to things like uh, shared responsibility models and uh, the inheritance of, of controls in, in the assessments and, and the assurance reporting which I believe high trust uh, addresses both of those as well, uh, especially in the cloud where maybe they're not uh, always willing to open up the kimono and say, here's all the stuff we're doing. <laughs> I, I will tell you on a weekly, every, every week, every, maybe every other week, I'm dealing with a third party uh, event where the, you know, some third parties delivering service to me have my, has my data and they've been ransomware, they've been breached, something's happened. And so I, I will simply say that, you know, I can't underscore enough how important it is to, to extend your, your, your pro, the programs and, and your reach to, to, to third parties to make sure that they're able to, to you know, securely deliver on those services and, and protect the, your, your, your information assets. So as we wrap here, I'm going to, a final thought from each of you, and I'm going to position it this way. So they're, they're looking for a recognized security practice. And in my view, this is an opportunity to maybe not just leverage what the industry thinks is good just because it's done a certain way for so long, but perhaps find the framework and the practice and the program that takes us forward in a way where we can actually protect the environment. Cause what I'm just thinking when, when you start to automate something, right? If you automate a bad process, you've just scaled that, that bad process. Um, if you, if you're using the wrong data, you're making bad decisions on bad data. So I think there's an opportunity here for HHS OCR to say, great, there are recognized security practices which ones are actually mature, which ones are actually 
being adopted in a way that are proactive and and not just uh, not just ticking the box of I, I've met these controls to to apply to this framework. So maybe John, your, your thoughts on that, and and maybe a message to the folks at HHS OCR, and maybe your fellow CISOs to to help rally them to say what they think on this topic. Uh, if, if I understand the question, I, I, you know, again, I think it's something I've, I've said is that, you know, uh, I, I'm not the smartest person in the world. I, I rely upon really smart people that, that are, are experienced and skilled in, in, in working with and, and establishing frameworks to be able to decide and help us understand what's important. Um, but again, that's why I think it is absolutely vital that, that, um, you thoughtfully implement a framework and, and, and make sure it's, it's functioning up, up within your environment appropriately, because it, it's going to guide you where you need to go, you know? Um, and, and, you know, I, I've, we, we've been working with high trust for a long, long time and high trust has certainly, uh, matured over the years and has gotten, um, the framework's gotten much more robust. And so, but each time we get certified and there might be more things we need to certify too. Um, but that also allows us to, to make sure that what we're focused on um, in that using that framework is what we should be focused on. So uh, again, I'm, I'm just a big fan of, 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 uh, you know, you know, applying and, and really driving, uh, using a framework um, and it's it's it it really does you know it, it does remove a lot of the guesswork it removes a lot of the uh, maybe um, the inconsistency and and um, again it, it relies upon really smart people like at NIST who can help uh, us understand where we we really need to be focused and so uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not but um, yeah it certainly does and I think I think the, the key word for me is practice right so actually it's one thing to have a framework it's another actually put it into practice and michael maybe some of your your, your thoughts as a closing remark on on the importance of actually putting it into practice in a consistent yeah. manner yeah so i guess three three clo closing points sean to to your question around what's the message to HHS and, and OCR as they continue to, to roll this out? What's the message to the, the CISO community? Um, I think organizations have to adopt and maintain conformance to an informative resource that's been identified. That resource has got to be comprehensive in nature. It's got to have the ability to uh, fight off reasonably anticipated threats and it's got to manage risks appropriately and address compliance requirements, of course, right? That's one. Two, that risk management security program must be periodically assessed um, by a independent third party that's specializing in those data security practices, right? So for example, when you look at the high trust ecosystem, we have uh, over a hundred assessor partners uh, that are auditors that are are in this space. They know how to verify and validate that, to your point, Sean, uh, these things are actually put in practice and operating effectively, right? And then lastly, I would say, or, these organizations that have the opportunity to achieve safe harbor, they must be able to demonstrate through a level of certification or, or other means that their risk management program components are aligned, they incorporate leading practices, they're free of gaps or heightened vulnerabilities uh, from a cyber threat perspective and, and address emerging cyber threats like, like ransomware. I think those, those are the three things to really think about um, as, as they roll this out and further define what it means to achieve some level of safe harbor. Yep. I love it. Thanks for that summary, Michael. And I think John, uh, yeah, it's great to get your, your input here and insights. And I, I think my, my key takeaway here is that this is a good thing, right? It, it's a, it's a call for re requests for information, a chance to provide some input into what's happening here.
And I applaud you, John, for taking this step immediately and, and working with Michael and the high trust yeah, team to help help put that together. Sure. I, you know, my closing, one of my one closing comment is, is I really hope that, that uh, HHS, you know, as they look at the, the, the RFI responses, um, recognizes they need to set the bar high enough. Uh, a, a low bar is not going to help anybody. I think a, a high bar here could be a huge incentive for organizations to decide to incrementally invest in their security programs and apply um, frameworks like high trust. Um, and I think if that happens, then that can have a dramatic positive impact on, on healthcare or cybersecurity. Yeah. So I, I was going to say a, a call to arms for fellow CISOs. Um, it, it's good to hear you say set the bar high. I, I'm, I'm hoping other CISOs <laughs> follow suit. Um, uh, yeah, just I, I think it's important, especially when we're talking critical infrastructure and, and the healthcare ecosystem, right? We we want that bar high. We want to we want to achieve greater things there from a cybersecurity perspective. So hopefully, your peers, John, and uh, all the folks you talk to, Michael, uh, looking at risk management and 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 their connection to uh, OCR take this seriously and provide their input um, to hopefully raise the bar for everybody. Great. So with that, Michael, John, really appreciate uh, sure. having this conversation with you. It was an honor to, uh, to dig into it. And for everybody listening and watching, uh, we'll include some links in the show notes for uh, this RFI and, and other resources John and Michael think uh, would help kind of frame this for everybody and uh, hopefully drive some action for folks. Thank you. Great. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, share ITSP Magazine with your friends, family, and colleagues. Thank you for listening.